Hello, and welcome to The Peter Principles. I'm Peter, your host. Today, we have another episode of 10 Questions with the Musical Mind. We're joined by Felix Hanneman, founding member of the band Zebra. Hope you enjoy it. Hello, folks, and welcome back to The Peter Principles. Today, our guest is the one and only Felix Hanneman of the band Zebra, also with the legendary Led Zeppelin tribute act Cashmere recently, uh, for the last several years. And he's doing his, uh, where are you today, Felix, in New York? I'm in New York, yeah. All right, well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate you calling. Um, As you know, uh, we're going over mainly the creative process, and I'd just like to get a little background from you. Um, Obviously, uh, most people know who you are and your accomplishments, and I'd like to go back to the beginning for our first question. Um, I know you were in a band called Maelstrom, and you started, yeah. you were playing bass in that band. Is that the first instrument you played, or was it another one? No, I started on guitar, actually. Okay. So guitar, bass, and keyboards. Correct. I went from guitar to keyboards, and then I picked up the bass. Excellent. Okay. That's Yeah, I didn't know about the guitar part. That's great. Um, I imagine that helps you in writing and that kind of thing also, being, you know, having, yeah. having facilities yeah. and everything. I know when I've written things before, I have no idea how to play keys, so I made some, you know, acoustic guitar recording years ago, and I can remember just like fumbling around with two net chords and the keyboard, just going, "Okay, I think that's a C." <laughs> just no idea what I was doing. But um, the other thing I want to ask is, you guys started off in Louisiana. Uh, moving to Long Island was obviously a bold move. Uh, were you guys a united front, or did one of you move first to see how it was, and then convince the other two to join you, or? Yeah, well, we uh, we had a, a friend of ours that lived in New Orleans that was from New York. Okay. He introduced us to a guy that ran a club named Lee Feldman, and the club was named the 1890s in uh, Baldwin, Long Island. And uh, I, I flew up there to meet him, you know, and tell him, you know, what kind of our expectations were and stuff. And then we flew him down in New Orleans to see the band before we got up there, just so to see so he could see what he was getting into. Okay. And then uh, we made a deal to uh, go up there, and then they put some de- de- dates together for us. And uh, that's really kind of how it all started out on Long Island. We we did our first show on New Year's Eve of 1977, so it was January 1st of 1978 that we well, ended the show, but it was New Year's Eve of 77 that we did our first show with a band called Rat Race Choir. Funny, okay. Yeah, and that's... uh. Mark Hitt's band, correct? Yes. Yeah. That was choir. Mark Hitt was in that band, and uh, he's uh, since played with a lot of other uh, top acts. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, that makes it easy to remember the date, too, that it was on New Year's Eve. Your first. It makes it easy to remember the date, too, that your first gig was on New Year's Eve. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's tough. It's absolutely. Yeah. Now, as Zebra evolved... Uh, you know, were you guys always, did you always have a progressive edge? Because you have straight ahead rock numbers and some uh, kind of boogie numbers and some that are more pop but uh, and some are heavier, but did you always have that progressive element in your music? Well, I mean, really, uh, you know, uh, Andy and I both really love the Beatles and I love the Stones and then he got into uh, the Allman Brothers and Led Zeppelin and he started really kind of... Uh, you know, studying Jimmy Page and Dwayne Allman, mm-hmm. and then you know the, the turn took more towards the you know the British rock with uh, with Zeppelin, the Beatles, and Moody Blues and stuff like that. Right. And uh, I was into the earlier Beatles and uh, Stones, and I also loved a lot of the folk rock stuff like the Birds and Dylan and Donovan and stuff like that. And uh, the guy had a lot more eclectic tastes. He had he uh was into uh, John McLaughlin of Mahavishnu Orchestra and a uh-huh. uh, band from Baltimore called Crack the Sky who was kind of a progressive band back then for, for that time. Crack the Sky, huh? I'll have to check them out. Yeah. Yeah, and, and McLaughlin stuff, I mean, obviously he's he's a legend. I I went through a phase of listening to him. It's I, I still like it, but in limited doses. I have to be in the mood for some of that stuff, but um, it's all incredible, obviously. Um yeah. Let's talk about progressive stuff. On one one of your songs, uh, "No Telling Lies," off the second album, obviously, 
there's a little yes. progressive part where the where the keyboard, you know, the, you know, part of the was like din 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 din. Now I'm wondering, as a keyboard player, was that something that you came up with that part, or did Randy or Guy or something? Well, I think it had to do with uh, there, we, at that time there was a keyboard that was a uh, a Core Poly 61. And uh, that was an analog keyboard, but it had a um, arpeggiator in it where mm. if you hit the arpeggiator button, when you hit a certain right three notes together, you know, it would arpeggiate right in tune, tune and in time with the song. So that's where that kind of game came from. Okay, that makes sense. So, But you have to hit the right notes for it to stay in key, obviously. Yes, because if you don't, then it like, goes out to infinity and screws up completely if you don't need the right three notes at the particular time then you're like uh you're messed up <laughs> oh has that ever happened to you live yes <laughs> just just do the other two guys stop and look at you <laughs> you know well the whole thing was is that you know if, it, if, if i didn't hit it right you started going uh off the wall then you know i'd have to you know really try to concentrate to hit the off button so it wouldn't keep doing it and try to keep in time with everybody else I'm trying to make sure that that thing goes off, you know. Like yeah. It's, it's tough to do. Yeah, I can see that. And that's like the old, uh, not with the keyboards, obviously, but the old saying from drummers: if you make a mistake playing drums, look angrily at the bass player. <laughs> <laughs> that's, probably, that's probably true. Yeah. Um, and talking about you guys, I think one of the the special things about Zebra is that it's always been the same three guys. From day one, there was never any, you know, no one left the band. There was never a, a different version of it. Um, and I think that helps, like for me as a fan, it helps me, it's like a home team you can root for when it's always the same people, and it lends a consistency. Um, I mean, do, yeah, do, you, I agree. do you credit that your, your, some of your success to that? And Well, I mean, yeah, I think that has a lot to do with it. I, I think, you know... Uh, you know, you're talking about like a home team. You know, when you uh, when you, whenever you uh, get interested in a band, you know, then all of a sudden you will become more interested in who who the players are, and then if you are following them, then you know, and, and they stay together, you know, it kind of gives you a, a sense of security, and you sure. know, and thinking that you know you picked the right ones to be with or whatever. I mean, but you know, there's so many bands now that have changed uh, uh, members, you know. Uh, now, the, nowadays, but it, it was not quite as prominent in the, in the early days. Yeah, I don't know why that is, but there's several bands I can think of where I'd buy the album and <clears throat> be you know interested, thought it was a great album, and then the second album come out and it's it's you know a new lead singer, which is hard to cover for, or you know a different guitar player, and you know it just gets tough to. You're right, it's just not consistent. You don't know if you're going to like it as much, so. Right. And you know, and not not small part of that is your albums were sometimes a few several years apart. So the fact that it's the same yeah. three guys, you know, those fans know basically what they're getting. So that helps, I would think. Yeah, it's a familiarity. Right, definitely. And let's talk about your uh, band, Cashmere, um, or not your band, but the band you're part of. It's a Zeppelin yeah. tribute band, correct? Or Zeppelin tribute band, and it's uh, it's been together for about fifteen or sixteen years, and I've been with them for about ten. Okay, how did your involvement with them come about? Well, I have the, the drummer in, in Cashmere. His name is Paul Cooper, and he's been friends with the band for a while. He used to do uh, some backup work over at Atlantic Records, and we kind of got to know each other. And then he did some shows. He had an original band that he did some stuff with Randy. And then, uh, you know, I met him a few times, and then uh, he had called me and asked me if I uh, could sub for them every once in a while, because the guy who was playing the bass and keyboards doing the John Paul Jones thing, uh, a lot of times, you know, they, he couldn't uh, make some of the gigs, so he Paul asked me if I would do, you know, sub in for the band every once in a while, and I said, sure, just as long as there's no conflict with my Zebra dates. Right. And then uh, what happened was there was a bunch of dates that was booked in one October, I don't know, it was something like about seven or eight dates in October, which was a pretty busy month, and uh, I wound up playing more than half of them, so, you know, they kind of looked at me and said, you know, you know, who's the substitute and who's, who's the member, you know? Ooh, right. So, kind of swapped positions, they gave me, you know, to, to become a member in the band, and then the guy that was 
the uh, guy who was originally in the band, you know, he he decided he was he would just be the substitute. So that's how it kind of, kind of flip flopped. I got gotcha. you. That makes sense. Well, does your your setup for Cashmere is is it the same equipment you're using with Zebra, or do you have different equipment, different settings? It, obviously, it, it's a little different. The keyboard setup is different. I use two uh, Korg M1s for Cashmere. With Zebra, I use a, uh, a Korg Triton, and uh, those so those that's about that's about it. I mean, other than the fact that I'm still playing, you know, bass up front. And then whatever the keyboard songs for Zebra and the keyboard songs for Cashmere, they just I just change up. But the setup is only a little difference in the fact that I'm using two M ones instead of uh, the tri- just one Triton with Zebra. Gotcha, gotcha. Do you guys does the set list change, or do you have like a, a standard like two or three different set lists you do to change it up, or for Cashmere? Yes. Well, Cashmere has a pretty good core of uh, you know regular up that most people would recognize and then every once in a while they have other songs that they've thrown in or you know stuff that they've played before that they want to reintroduce and so you know uh, it's, it's the, the basic core of the, of the set stays pretty much the same and then we will revolve say three to five songs in and out of the set list depending on you know the season or whatever like in the summertime you know we play a little longer we do a lot more festivals and Pairs and motorcycle rallies. Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll, we'll throw in a lot more stuff during the summertime because those sets and those shows are a little bit longer. Well, I guess you could really test an audience loyalty. Just come out on stage and open up with hats off to Roy Harper. <laughs> <laughs> if they stay for that, they really like you. <laughs> I've, never, I've never done that song with Cashmere or uh, Zebra, but I used to do it with another uh, Zeppelin tribute I was with called uh, Hindenburg. Okay, that's funny. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, now, <clears throat> you know, I, I know you've mentioned and I've seen you do where you kind of play the bass with one hand and the fret, rather, sorry, the fret hand, and then you be, might be doing some some higher melodies on the keyboards. Do you have to run a pretty high gain on your bass to be able to cut through the mix well on that? No, I have. Um, for my bass, I, I you know I. I I play a uh, I, I play a uh, I, I've been as SG and it's a really you know it's uh, active pickup so it has a lot of punch to it. Okay. And I play that for uh, Cashmere and for Zebra, but on this, the keyboard stuff, I use the bass sound as a little more a little more mushy. Uh, you know, it's a little softer mm-hmm. and uh, it's not quite as edgy. Yeah, it's probably hard to get an attack sound out of that, but huh. Have you ever exper- have you ever owned like five string bases or, or or more than that, or do you stick with four? No, I'm I'm, I'm old school, man. I only uh, can only play four. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> if you want six strings, you'll pick up your guitar, right? Yeah, well, I guess that's true. Yeah. Um, now, talking about musicians and stuff and being old school, are there any newer acts that you really like of the younger crop of players? Yeah, I really, I really like Foo Fighters. I think Dave Grohl is really great. Oh yeah, Dave Grohl is great. Yeah, and he's just really authentic seeming to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and what I like about him is he really seems to be he almost like his his purpose is to help educate the casual fans because he's always championing the classic rock acts, if that's really a word, classic rock. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I know he's brought out David Lee Roth on stage to sing Panama, I think it was. And he, he really highlights his uh, influences. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and that's cool. I mean, because, you know, I've, I've, uh, I like when bands are wear it on their sleeve who they like. There's nothing wrong being influenced by anybody. Like, I know on their, not their debut album, but their second album, um, Dream Theater, mentions you guys as an influence. Yeah, well, uh, Mike Portnoy was the drummer at Twitch Dream Theater uh, in the beginning, and they used to open up shows before us, before they were signed. And, oh. And then, uh, you know, then they started doing uh, really big business. They got signed, and then uh, they did a, uh, a remake of Take Your Fingers From My Head. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that they were opening for you, that would have been Charlie Domenici on vocals back then. Is that? That would have been with Charlie Domenici on vocals before they were signed. Oh, I'm really, 
I really don't know. I don't remember. Yeah. That, that was back then. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, but I do just remember that, that second album. It listed you. I think it listed Van Halen and Rush and, you know, a lot of the big players. But I think it's cool when bands are, like, really vocal about, like, this is who we like, this is who influenced us, because it's interesting, and it, and it points people to other bands they might not be familiar with. Right. Well, I mean, they were pretty uh, progressive. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, I... I mean, you know, maybe maybe he was influenced, you know, by uh, Alex Van Halen, Mike Portnoy might have been, but uh, I mean, I didn't hear any evidence of that in their music at the time. They were really more like a, a yes, moody blues, ELP, you right? Know, stuff kind of like that. With a, I think a little harder edge. Oh yeah, definitely a harder edge. But they they are the the more recent kings of the fifteen minute long song. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember when I first got into them, just thinking like, how are they even remembering all these? I mean, but I don't know. Like, what good does a clip track do if all your songs have fourteen time signatures? <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, that's a lot of time signatures. Yeah. Um, now I spoke pretty recently to to Randy Jackson, and he was telling me that he wants to put out a new Zebra album at some point. Um, I mean, I'll be excited right. to see that. Is that have you ever considered doing another solo album on your own, or you know, or are you looking forward to getting I, back with? I, have, I, I released one solo album around uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, of 2000. Right. And uh, you know, I was just kind of like done with that. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just kind of done with that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I Plus, I don't really have the gear to sit around and uh, do that stuff. Uh, Randy really has a, a lot of uh, in, in-house studio stuff, so uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll join together and do something like that. I don't know. Yeah, you, you need to get another album out before the next millennium. Yeah, that would be good. That would be a good idea. Right. <laughs> the, uh, you know, how do you pronounce it? Do you call it Zebra 3.5 or do you say 3.V? It's, it's 3.5. That's what I've always said, okay. The, the, Roman, the Roman numeral was just another way of kind of throwing things off. That's sure. Wrong. Kind of a play on numbers. No, I've always said it in my head as 3.5. I just wanted to know, like, have I been imagining that wrong for all these years? But um, I knew learning Roman numerals would come in handy one day. But uh, well, we, we had to actually put inserts in the album to let people know how to pronounce it because people were saying three point V, which is, I mean, it was clearly a Roman numeral. But, right. Uh, you know, maybe a lot of people don't know what a Roman numeral is other than the Super Bowl. Well, I don't but, think uh, they maybe they don't teach Latin anymore. We literally had to put a uh, put inserts that said, you know, writing out the word three and writing out the word point and writing out the word five. <laughs> Well, that's pretty funny. <laughs> the uh, well, let's see. I think that about wraps us up with the questions. Um, what dates do you have coming up with Zebra or with Cashmere that we can look forward to? Well, with Cashmere, I got a couple of dates coming up for uh, this month in June, actually. Uh, on I think it's the uh, the fourteenth, we're going to be playing in uh, Cleveland at a uh, room called the uh, Music Music Box Supper Club. Okay. And then on the 15th, we're playing in uh, a quarry park called Nelson Ledges Quarry Park, park, which is right outside of Akron. So that's on the 14th and 15th of June. And you can go to uh, CashmereRocks.com to find uh, other dates that we may have. Okay, CashmereRocks.com. And Zebra is BehindTheDoor.com, or do I have that wrong? No, it's, it's, it's TheDoor.com. TheDoor.com for Zebra, okay. Right. Um, obviously in reference to the song. But, but um, I think that's about it. Well, I know we'll pe- folks can go to the websites and check out your dates coming. If you've not seen Felix and the guys, it, it's worth. It's a great show. It's worth going to see. But uh, I just want to thank you again for joining us, Felix, and uh, appreciate it. And have a good day. Okay, man. Thanks a lot. I yeah. Appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.